Good morning, everyone. Before we begin, we'll take a quick tour around our presentation room. Please note that we have now turned on the recording function for archiving and playback. You are being recorded. Beginning in the top right, you'll find a list of participants. If you run into any technical issues during the presentation, hover your mouse over my name, Dan Wilton, and a menu will appear to send me a private chat message. Below the participant list is the chat area. The chat is public and is recorded. Here you can post your responses to anything that might come up during the presentation. It's also an opportunity for the microphone shy to post questions to our presenter at the end of the talk. Above the main window, you'll find a button showing a person with a raised hand. That's a pull-down menu for making the session more interactive with options for a smiley or applause. After the presentation, we'll release the microphone for questions. To use your microphone, click the microphone button next to the little man once to begin speaking and again to disconnect when you've finished your question. Do remember to keep your microphone off when you're not speaking to avoid any feedback or background noise. Finally, I encourage you to visit our site at cider.athabascau.ca for further information on CIDR. A number of you have come forward to suggest sessions for this season. Watch for our growing list over the next few weeks as we sort through them all and confirm dates. Be sure to join us next month on November 7th for a presentation by Joshua Weidlick on social affordances, social presence, and sociable online learning environments. Today's slides are posted on our site and a full recording will be added about an hour after the session ends. And here we go. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the October session of the 2018-19 CIDR session series from the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning and the Center for Distance Education at Athabasca University. Last month, we heard from one of our editors at Erodal, introducing a cutting edge technology that may shape education in the years to come. This month, we're joined by our other editor to look at one of the age old challenges of teaching and learning, assessment, and how it can fit into our online learning today. Our guest today is Dr. Diane Conrad, co-editor for the International Review of Research in Open and Distributed Learning, and instructor in Athabasca University's doctoral program in distance education. Before her semi-retirement, she was Athabasca's director of the Center for Learning Accreditation and associate professor and coordinator of the adult education program at the University of New Brunswick. More recently, she's just back from the founding meeting of CORE, the Center for Open Education Research at the University of Oldenburg in Germany. CORE aims to increase collaborative interdisciplinary research, perform cutting edge research in open, attract research fellows and faculty, and offer an international interdisciplinary master's program, the Master of Management in Technology Enhanced Learning, launching soon. And of course, Dr. Conrad is author of the newly published Assessment Strategies for Online Learning, Engagement and Authenticity with Jason Openo. Assessment Strategies is available for free download through AU Press, or you can order a print copy and mark it up with notes. I'm now passing the microphone to Dr. Conrad. Feel free to use your applause buttons here. Everyone, welcome Dr. Diane Conrad. Hello, good day. Good afternoon, where I am, and thank you, Dan, for that generous introduction. Can you hear me? Okay, that's great. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I want to thank Dan and thank CIDR for the opportunity to be here. This is my first CIDR presentation. And, um, and I'm thrilled to be able to talk about uh, the new book that has been recently published, which, as you may have noticed, or you will notice shortly, is uh, red in color. And I have taken to calling it the red book. Make out of that uh, what you will, the little red book. 
Okay, I will, the presentation isn't that long and I can entertain questions as we go if you have them, but I think we'll have lots of time at the end for questions and discussion. And there it is. There's the red book. I apologize for the blurriness of the enlarged image, uh, but I think you can see the uh, the main the main words. And this is a good time for me to put in a good word for AU Press and their fabulous system of open publication, which means you can download a copy of the book absolutely free. Uh, or you could buy it if you so choose and mark it up with notes. But having an open press such as we do at Athabasca University is indeed a wonderful thing. So what is the book about? It would be easy to say it's about assessment <laughs> because it is. And it's about online assessment. And another delimitation is that it primarily attends to assessment in the social sciences and humanities, because that's where I am located. And because the way we learn in social sciences and humanities offers us, in my opinion, a more inclusive, comprehensive, and if you will, exciting way to assess uh, our learners and work with our learners through the notions and purposes of assessment. I wanted the title to be the opposite of what it is. I wanted the title, I designed the title as Engagement and Authenticity, Assessment Strategies for Online Learning. A small difference, you may say, and this is one of the learnings that I had as a first time book writer and, uh, yes, a book writer. The press suggested that we switch the title around because assessment strategies would be up front and the first thing people would see when the last part of the title got dropped off, which it does. My emphasis, and I will speak as, as, as me, as my, even though I have a co-author, because it somehow comes, <laughs> it comes more naturally. Uh, I don't mean to take credit from my co-author but it just, I'll, I'll try and say we if, if, if I can remember to do that. Um, however, the book was my initiative, and my initiative included a title in the reverse order. And again, it's been changed. My interest is in the notion of engagement and authenticity. There are strategies given, but it's certainly not a how-to book simply doesn't go at the topic in that way. So most of you have probably read the screen by now. As an old adult educator, uh, old in both ways, I've been at it for many years, I know I don't have to read the screen to you. Plus, I essentially took this from the blurb about the book online and edited somewhat. In short, a synopsis of what's just gone before for those of you who didn't read it closely. Assessment, as Dan indicated, has always been a contentious area of teaching and learning. And it's not well talked about. It's sort of, oh, how shall we say, a little secret or tries to be a secret in the work that we do. Because much as we want to tell ourselves that we're objective and we're professionals, of course we're professionals, and, and um, hard-nosed educators, it's really not possible to be that way in the humanities and social sciences where assessment is concerned. It is a subjective assessment slash evaluation of what's put before you. And for those of you who have team taught, or done any kind of academic work with a colleague, you probably have experienced the difference in opinions that arise from reading, uh, well, anything. A learner's work, a text, from watching a presentation, from attending a conference. It's very, very hard to get two similarly trained academics to completely line up 
on one topic. And I've experienced this through a number of parts of my life, most recently as the director of um, Prior Learning Assessment and Recognition at Athabasca University, where in having experts in certain areas do assessment of a student's portfolio, we often came across very differing opinions, which is I, I found rather striking, perhaps led in some way to the formulation of this book. Assessment must be a critical part of the learning cycle and not an add-on. Unfortunately, in many occasions, it's treated as an add-on for the purpose of measurement. And of course, we address this in the book. And it, it shouldn't be that way. It should be a part of the initial planning stages so that assessment can be congruent with everything else you're doing in the course, uh, your course outcomes which you're guiding where you need to go in the course, your course activities which are helping you get there, and your content, of course. Our supposition is that online assessment is not fully realized, that in the transition we haven't taken advantage of the online medium and media in general and all its affordances. And we can fix this. We can make this change. Those of us who are here today, and those of you whose names I recognize, and those of you with whom I work, uh, it's like I'm preaching to the choir. You all know the value of online learning, and no doubt support it hardly, as I do. But many do not. Many In many parts of the world and many institutions, online learning is still struggling to become respectable and faulty efforts to jump on the online train often lead to poor instruction and poor training in that area and assessment suffers as a result. But again, we can fix this by the book. <laughs> Is this book different? Um, and different, you know, here's a, a wiggle word if there ever is one. It's not a hardcore book of strategies, as I said earlier, do this, do that. It's more a philosophical approach to the notion of assessment, why it is important, how to make it important to you, and how to build on that relationship between you your beliefs, and the assessment that you um, introduce as a result of, of that uh, dynamic duo. So the book is not about how to build tests or exams. It's not about how to measure validity, reliability, and all those quantitative things. My background, which is obvious in the book, plays into this very heavily because I spent most of my career and much of my preparation for my career as an adult educator, I guess I still am an adult educator, although by definition I'm just a post-secondary educator, and believe me, there is by definition a difference. But as an adult educator, we don't, how shall I say, it's not that we don't believe in exams, although that could partly be said to be true, but we certainly don't endorse them as the best way to assess what an adult learner has learned. And therefore, uh, there is really no uh, issue in this book about those kinds of quantitative measures. And again, the book is directed not to the hard sciences and not to the quantitative thinkers that if I may generalize, may be found in those areas. So here are some of the principles and interests and directions that the book um, builds on and hopefully captures. First of all, it's heavily guided by constructivist theory, and that's explained um, fairly concretely, I think, in the book, as well as uh, outlines of all the other appropriate adult learning theories and I think, and this is where I have to go into the book itself, I think I have to, that's in chapter three, what do you believe, and talks about the importance of understanding your own particular philosophical beliefs that guide 
your practice. So we're looking at depth and breadth of assessment processes rather than surface how to, um, shall I say, band-aid treatments or, or simply outcomes. We're interested in the philosophies of teaching and learning. Again, the humanities and social sciences are our focus. We have a strong connection to the principles of adult learning. And following from that, we're convinced of the critical value of authenticity and engagement in online learning, in learning uh, per se, and assessment, because of course they go hand in hand. Here is a capture of the table of contents of the book and the underlined parts, which are not underlined in the book, more or less try to point you to some of the highlights of what I feel is really important. Now, obviously, it's all important to me, to Jason, and that's why it's here. But I was trying to pick out some, some key issues for, um, for focusing on. So you can see we started in the way that I always like to start my writing and my thinking with the big picture. And as a teacher in graduate programs, both master's and doctoral level, I see learners struggling often to ground themselves or, as we say, hive off the section of the topic that they're going to talk about. In other words, to create the framework for what they're about to write. And we did the same thing in the book. We needed to create the framework for what we were about to say, which meant establishing a context, which meant the big picture, which meant a view of not only the assessment world, but the learning world. And that was a very challenging piece to write because that needs an extensive literature in order to um, bring it home, so to speak. One of the criticisms of the book, <coughs> excuse me, not a serious criticism, I, I must be unmodest and uh, confess that there was no real serious criticism of the book. In fact, the reviewers were very, very enthusiastic, very, very kind. It was, oh, perhaps an editor at AU Press, and even my good friend Terry Anderson, who was kind enough to write the uh, foreword, mentioned that readers might find the number of references <laughs> overwhelming. Well, I laughed at that because there are a lot of references. It's a very scholarly book. And I like that because it gives me solidity as a, as a writer and as a reader. As a teacher, I also like to see that in my students' work. So I didn't take offense at that, and I didn't feel it was a bad criticism, although I know there are a lot of references in the book. And for me, that just says, hey, we went out there and we did our research. Um, the second chapter underlies underlines the relationship of adult education principles to online learning assessment because it's, it's my view as a long-term adult educator that online learning is a child of adult education in that the same principles are at work in order to make online learning accessible and successful. You need to be mature, you need to be self-driven to a degree, you need to be self-directed, you need to take responsibility for your learner, for your learning. And there's a, a whole level of um, affective domain issues that more or less revolve around social presence, referring to um, the three presences constructed by Anderson Garrison. Rourke, uh, Archer and Rourke back in 1998 to 2001, that very seminal research that they did. 
on a shirk grant and all the publications that came out of that social presence the ability to present yourself online in a reasonable mature and respectful way i'm going to probably use the word respect quite a few times in this in this talk is is uh, is so important so much a part of being an adult so much a part of being an adult learner and and just so much a part of of, of being um what shall I say, a good person online in the scholarly sense. What do you believe, again, chapter three really tries to pin down, first of all, explain, and then pin down the importance of your philosophical stance to what you do online, first of all, as a teacher, and then more precisely with assessment. How does that shape? How, do you, how does your worldview philosophically shape what you feel is important and how you're going to go about it? The next chapter, um, Authenticity Engagement, was, was a tough one to write because it's hard to extract the notion of quality from everything else because quality is built into everything do? Is it, is it a quality activity? Is it quality content? Is it quality participation, quality exchange? So sort of pulling it out was, was tough. And we had a, a tough time with a number of, of these kinds of issues because everything is so nested. Everything is so interrelated. And, and we do mention that in the book, not by way of apology, but perhaps by way of explanation. Here's an interesting point. Uh, I'll, I'm going to talk at the end of, of the talk about um, things we learned. And, and we learned the most amazing things in dealing with the publishers uh, who did a super job on making a very nice volume out of the manuscript. But at one point, near, near the end, at the end, they didn't want to have an index. And I was quite shocked. And because I prepared the index myself, so I didn't have to pay somebody else to do it, because indexing is apparently quite expensive. And I said, well, uh, you know, that's like uh, a dog without a tail or, or, you know, a story without an ending. It needs to have an index. And um, they had their reasons, but I had my reasons, and we do have an index in the book. And somehow they thought that the whole notion of engagement and authenticity and assessment was so pervasive that people could just find what they wanted anywhere. And, and that's, uh, that's certainly not true, even with the interrelatedness. So there is an index in the book, thank goodness. Uh, my initial index was much longer because I'm not an indexer. I've never done that before. So that was a learning for me. I cut it down probably by two-thirds into a, um, a smaller index, which I, I hope is useful. The next chapter, uh, we start to get specific and look at some various types of assessment tools that are named there. And then we moved into another area, which is increasingly fascinating to me, as uh, noted by Dan. I just returned from um, a founding meeting of uh, some researchers from around the world who are going to um, study the whole notion of open, which is now very prevalent. So we looked at alternative assessments and flexible learning badges and accreditation, all those things. And there are more topics that could spring from and inform the notion of open learning, open scholarship, open education, open science, open publishing, and, and, and so forth. And then chapter seven, the planning chapter, is where the rubber hits the road most of all. And I thought it was very bold to go out and select at random some courses from Canadian universities and examine their assessment structures from what I could pull from online. So a part of the delimitation of that activity was not being able to access uh, each and any course that I chose through the online medium as far as their assessment strategy goes. But I was able to find, I think, five. And I could have 
happily worked on 20 because there's so much to say about this. But I settled on, on the five as representative and went through the assessment strategies that were presented and how they were, in a nutshell, either authentic or not authentic, inauthentic, and asked some questions about what could be done in these particular courses, just based on what I could read on the internet to, um, I would say, improve their assessment strategy. And there's a lot of room for discussion there. But um, that's what that chapter was about. And then we had to deal with um, other types of learning. And so we have a chapter on flexible, flipped, and blended. And then, of course, self-assessment's a, a very important uh, part of assessment and also a very contentious part. And then at the very end of it all, the publishers said, I guess you have to write a conclusion. And so there are a few words of conclusion, which are kind of sentimental. We had, I did, I think Jason did too, I had a lot of fun writing this book. There's a lot of person, there's a lot of me uh, in it, actually, as a writer. And somehow being retired now frees me up to do those things that I never felt I could do before when I was uh, actually engaged as an employee in the workforce and certainly never had time to do. So there you have it. There's the table of contents. Now, one of the ideas that I had uh, was to bring in other voices from so many of my colleagues out there who I thought would have all kinds of things to say. And we do have, as the final appendix, it was initially intended by me to be um, the last chapter. The publishers thought it would be better as an appendix. And we had a little bit of going back and forth about this because, true to form, I personally don't agree with everything that everybody wrote in the appendix, uh, what they contributed, my colleagues. Uh, I agree very, very heartily with some of them and not so heartily with others. But I felt that other voices was just that, that there needed to be other voices heard from us to give a, a more representative view of, of some of the approaches to assessment in the field. I put out a call. Uh, I was a little disappointed by the response, probably at the end of the day, given the length of the book and all the things attached to publishing, like costs, it might be a good thing that we didn't get hundreds of responses. We were able to give good voice to those who, who did respond. I was going to list them here on the slide, but you can find them quickly enough um, through the PDF if you choose to. These are the themes of the book, which uh, I've also taken from a section that, um, that deals with themes. Dan suggests a volume two for other voices. That would really be, it would, that would be a very different book, and it would be a very interesting book. I'm hoping, and again, this is probably tied up with the success of the first book and numbers and money and such, that Jason and I can do um, uh, a second edition of the book in a few years, as I'll attend to later. Uh, we certainly know there's more to say. And we're keeping track of that, so it would be uh, it would be nice to be able to do that if the press sees some value in it. So the first theme is that assessment is a part of the learning cycle, and the learning cycle includes the outcomes and strategies and the content and what you're going to do and how you're going to do it and of course how you're going to 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 assess it and everything needs to match up. I don't want to simplify it. Um, glibly, but it really does need to match up. And in my work with uh, many, many faculties and many programs um, across my career, I've become aware of the fact that many university instructors don't understand that their activities and their content really do have to align with the assessment at the end of the day. And 
as we all know, a good number of university profs are not trained educators. They're trained um, historians. They're trained chemists. They're trained social workers, not particularly trained educators. And some of them have just simply never come across this information. Hence, teaching and learning un um, institutes, schools, departments in many of our universities and colleges. And this next theme attends to chapter three. You've got to know what you think about teaching and learning. You've got to know where you stand on this. Are you a behaviorist? Do you want to dump that information into your learner's head and then measure them like little jugs until they're filled up to the proper amount? the proper level. This is called banking by Friere, as most of you probably know. And it's not a chosen way of learning or assessing. So the activities you choose and the processes you use throughout the course and to implement your activities will reflect your values. So for example, if, if you believe that developing your learner's autonomy and sense of self is the most important part of what you're offering them. Ask yourself how that will differ from if you adhere to a, what's called a progressive philosophy when you think what you're doing primarily is training them for the workforce. I don't care if they're too autonomous. You don't care about their self-esteem to the degree that you would if you were following a humanist philosophy more closely, and so on and so forth. So that those are the arguments presented in that chapter about philosophy and worldview. The next theme um, is that in order to be classified an authentic assessment, and there is a lot of literature on this, and we draw from a lot of literature on this, so if you're not um, informed about what an authentic assessment is, you can pretty much find out in this book, and it will uh, show you the way to other folks who have done research in this area. One of them is Patricia Cranton who is a wonderful, accessible Canadian writer and in, in the adult education field and has done some good work on authenticity. So with authenticity, what you're doing is giving the, the authors a chance to make the connection with their own learning and real life situations and also with the prior learning. In other words, rather than issue a static question, to every group you have that ask them to go into their literature or their readings or your notes or their notes. You're creating an assessment question that somehow has them draw on themselves their personal experience and connect that to the learning at hand. In other words, it's not a freight train. Authentic assessment is not a freight train barreling down the hill where nobody pays attention to the course content, the topic at hand, or the course outcomes. Rather, it attempts to tie them together so that learners can engage on a somewhat personal level, and again, this is variable and discussable, with their own experience and, and what they, in particular, bring to the table. Authentic assessment, therefore, is often ill-defined, which means simply that it's more open and uh, somewhat, if you want to make the analogy between an open-ended question and a closed-ended question, it's a little simplistic, but it's kind of that, that sort of thing. It allows input from the learner. In a very practical way, this also eliminates the possibility of plagiarism to some degree and academic dishonesty to some degree because, as someone stated, and we quote this person in the book, and I can't recall the name, anyone who wants to, well, let's be blatant and say cheat or conduct academic dishonesty, um, will find a way to do that. Another thing. 
online learning, and you can see how we're moving in our thought progression here now, we're into online learning, is a great place to make these authentic assessments. And this is where we need to take advantages of the affordances that it makes. And it makes those affordances because you can get right from your computer into such a vast landscape of resources, of media, and all kinds of different media apart from the old, from a library book, for example, and, and bring that forward. Limited really only by the creativity of the instructor and perhaps your bandwidth. Another theme, I think I just said this. Um, you know, authentic assessment will still tolerate essays and reports and purely text-based work. But it also supports a variety of other kinds of assessment that, quite frankly, are much more fun. Now, when I say fun, again, I'm not talking about throwing the baby out with the bathwater and just having a lot of fun. By the way, and it is, I have to throw this in because it's, I just read it recently and it's so cute. The expression, throw the baby out with the bathwater, actually originated years ago when people with a family of seven or 12 in the old days on the farm uh, could only draw a bath once a week on a Saturday night and everybody took their turns having, um, having a bath, I guess from oldest to youngest, because by the time the baby got in there, the water was so dirty and black, there was a danger of actually tossing the baby out with the bath water because you couldn't see through it. I just thought the story was, was hilarious. Anyway, um, in the book, we look at all these different types of assessment and talk about how it can provide, how they can provide a more authentic experience. A journal, for example, you know, a lot of people are very um, dismissive of journal work because they think that it sort of just send, ends up to be a, a story about self and opens the door to a lot of rambling and non-topical discussion. And of course, that's always possible. But with the proper direction, instruction, and examples, and uh, rubric, dare I say rubric, because I'm a little sensitive about that, and we may discuss it later, um, the journal can be a very, very wonderful instrument for assessment and authentic assessment as the journal writer, the learner, makes the connection between his or her learning experiences and the material that's been presented in a critical sense. So all this, of course, is dependent on the instructor setting up the assignment so as not to have it appear to be a diary or an event log. And this is hard for some people. I'm teaching um, one course at the most advanced academic level we have and another course at the next most advanced academic level that we have. And I'm constantly surprised by learners who do not know how to self-reflect and critically self-reflect in a way that makes their completion of a journal assignment successful. This is, this is um, always a surprise to me. So group work, and I acknowledge, we acknowledge in the book that group work is disdained by many and all for good reason. I know we've all been there, but it also provides a valuable experience for community building and learning and other skills which are essential to perfect at, uh, at graduate and doctoral level. 
portfolios, again, another wonderful way to learn, another wonderful way to assess projects, etc. So this, there is a section, as we noted in the uh, overall chapter slide, where all these various types of assessment activities um, are described. There was more to say. There was more to say in the book. Um, we couldn't say it. We ran out of time. We ran out of energy. Um, the press wants to watch how long its publications are. And as we were writing, um, more material was, was coming out. Hence, hence uh, the instant idea for another volume and a collection. Now I wanted to I wanted to find a nice picture of of me talking, of me saying things, but there wasn't one, so I put up a picture of me and a darling little dog named Timmy, who was part pug, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but he was just my pal when he was and he loved to ride in the car. So so that's Timmy. And me. One of the things about which there is more to say is captured in this in this quote, which it comes from the book, although it's sort of um, alluding to another book which uh, had just come out in 2017 about open. And I found I'm trying to just think of the. It's a couple of, I believe, authors from India. And I'm looking quickly for their names because I can't remember it. But the index, the shortened index, doesn't have all the, all the references names in here in the index where I would have liked to have seen them. Oh, thank you, Leila. So um, I'm interested in, was interested and still am interested in this 2017 publication about things open because currently my colleague Paul Prinslow and I are at the very end stage of editing our own volume on open, which I hope to have into the publisher uh, next month as a matter of fact, which hopefully everything going well will be published open. So. The age of open, which is one of the ways we talk about it, uh, is is just going to continue to change things, um, to disrupt things in a good way, and perhaps in not good ways, and to open appropriately things up to more excitement. Let's call it excitement. Maybe that's a euphemism. I'm not sure. And of course, this is what the Center for Research and Open um, Education that we attended last week in Germany was talking about. So um, lots of things coming coming there and it very, very exciting to be a part of it. And for those of you who are looking for research topics or dissertation topics, um, this is still open, <laughs> no pun intended. This is still available to, to get in there and examine uh, the effects uh, of um, of, of open education, open scholarship, open science, open publishing. It just more or less goes on forever. And I have to plug here for prior learning assessment, which is still near and dear to my heart, which is in itself a type of openness. It's the institution being open to recognizing learners past and experiential learning, in other words, learning that they bring with them that has not been acquired in a formal classroom situation, but can be deemed valuable and, in fact, can be assessed in a rigorous process and credited towards their program. I wanted, I think I have about three minutes or so, and I wanted to talk about my reflections on writing a book um, because doing this was a dream for me and um, 
and and I'm, I can't tell you how pleased I am that it finally got out the door. As, as we got closer and closer to the end of it, I was just terrified that somehow something would happen and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to see it come to light, but I did. And I'm so, I'm so happy about that. Why write a book? Uh, why write a journal article? That was a decision I, I um, a topic, decision, question I encountered, oh my gosh, quite a few years ago now, but not that many, not so many that I've forgotten. Um, why write a book? Why write a journal article? Because you have something to say. Because you think you have something to say that is valuable. Because you've been in the field long enough to know that you have something to say. And you've read enough of other folks' work to know that you could say something perhaps even better, something more intriguing, something more current. Um, although I honestly maintain there's nothing new under the sun, but there's often a new way to express what's under the sun. So why write a book? I had it in me to write a book. I, I, that's, I, this all gets very, uh, very fuzzy, but there it is. These are very personal things. I had it in me to write a book, and I have it in me to write a couple more books, and these are things I need to do. I didn't have time to do them when I was working. Uh, there was just always so much to do, although I did get a start with journal articles, and that is a good start for those of you who are contemplating a writing career. Journal conference papers, journal articles, and, and books which are more relevant in some fields than others. So these are all things you need to check out. One is good practice for the other, although none of them is the same as the other. So this is one of the things that you will learn, and there are guidelines and ways to learn it. I learned um, from the writing. I learned what publishers want and what some of their limitations are, and what they'll do for you, and what they won't do for you, like an index. And I could easily go into the indexing uh, trade, I suppose, once I'm finished writing books or finished teaching, because it's kind of fun to do. And it requires that kind of picky mentality and detailed work that sometimes I really enjoy. There is a lot of detailed work. This is something you learn when you're writing a book. It's just the same as when you're doing your dissertation, when you're writing a journal article. It's incredibly, um, I was going to say tedious, but you can't feel that it's tedious, even though formatting can be tedious work. But you take such a close look at your work as you're writing. You take such a close look at how you construct ideas. So it's a window of self-reflection into your own process. So therefore, having encountered that and lived through it, you end up, my idea is, better coming out the other side. So naturally, it's going to make you uh, a keener writer and a keener reviewer and a keener observer. This is, this is the ideal state. So my own learning from writing the book on that side of things was immense. And I also learned about timetabling and scheduling and being the leader of the project because my co-writer was much better at that part of things than I was. I'm kind of a, well, get it in when you're ready. Send it to me when you're ready. And I learned that that's not good enough. Um, that's sort of been my mantra through most of my career. Some of my students will see that as well. And that doesn't always work. So a lot of self-revelation in, in, um, in writing, which I'm hugely appreciative of and will apply to my current work and whatever is going to come next. And afterwards, speaking of coming next, um, I'm just crazy about the notion of being able to write, being able to say the things that I have both learned and thought and believed in in my 35 plus years of working with adults and in education, finally having found the time to have a voice. There's a couple of issues here. One for me is the time to have a voice, but also having a voice. I, it took me, I was an adult when I came to do my, my doctoral work through personal circumstance. 
and and I didn't always feel I had a voice, and that's just not genderism and, and feminism and inequality in the workplace and all that stuff. It's just personal. So so that power, if you will, um, is fabulous. And all that said, you work your, well, head off, let's say, um, and you write this book and you put all your energies into it and you slave over every comma, I do anyway, period, and formatting and hold your fingers and wait for the reviews and then finally it gets out there, it's real, you hold it in your hands and your life really doesn't change much. Your life doesn't change, you just, you know, you've got a book now and it's very nice and those of you who have books in the crowd perhaps will know what I'm talking about. And I guess the last thing I should say is that academic writing never makes you rich. It's not a matter of making money. We sign a little paper that talks about, you know, whatever, the royalties or whatever you call them. But I know Terry Anderson, who's written and edited and released many books, jokes about being able to buy a cup of coffee or a dinner every five years from the uh, rewards, the monetary rewards from his work. So um, I'm not going to get rich um, from from ever writing a book, especially one that's freely downloadable, at which point I should say again, thank you to AU Press for being uh, being so innovative and, and so supportive. And Dan says it's all about the fame, right? Yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm so famous now. Anyway, um, I think let me see. I think that concludes what I have to say today. Indeed it does. So uh, thank you, Dan, for the chance. Thank you, Cider. And there is my contact information at Athabasca should anybody want to um, talk to me further about anything. The book, assessment, my fame. <laughs> okay, Dan, I'm going to mute my mic now and turn it over to you. Or maybe I won't, because I can't. So I'll just be quiet. Okay, thank you. Uh, that is, again is Dr. Diane Conrad on Assessment Strategies for Online Learning. And yes, do check out the book. It is more than just assessment. It is also about teaching and learning. And you'll be uh, very surprised and pleasantly surprised at uh, the depth of content in there. All right, so at this point, we go to the Q&A. So anyone who has any questions, you're welcome to grab the microphone. The microphone button is in the top bar. It looks like an old fashioned microphone. Click it once to turn it on, on and be sure to remember to click it again to turn it off when you've completed your question to avoid any echoes or feedback. And of course, you're also welcome to post questions and comments in the chat box. Thank you, Dan. Did I mention that you have a super radio voice and could be easily, you know, hosting the afternoon uh, drive home show? Um, a question about adult education principles and first year post secondary students, and this is this is talked about uh, frequently and often and with difficulty in post secondary circles. Um, it's hard with those with those young kids who come in from a high school situation because the high school mantra is considerably different. So they do need preparation. And when they do online learning, that online learning must be more structured and more scaffolded and less constructivist in nature in order to accommodate, let's say, their immaturity. Now, I can't generalize. One can't generalize. I can think of myself as a first-year student. I was as immature and, and not ready as anybody. And, and so the course design needs to reflect the help that they need. And they will need help. And they will need instruction. Now, years ago, it might have been 1979, Perry did an important study in the United States on college students looking at their cognitive level, sort of, sort of um, 
using Bloom's taxonomy, or at least alluding to the cognitive levels of learning, and found that in the first two years of, of college students out of four, they didn't have those skills. They needed to develop them, and they hadn't developed them in the first two years. So that goes a long way to answering your question about, um, about preparing those, uh, those youngsters. And strategies, well, it just it comes down to, I, I can't obviously go through them at this point, and I can't even tell you how much we refer to that in the book, but I know we do. Just it, they, they just need more direction, more concreteness, less openness, um, less constructivism, if you will, because they're simply not ready for that. I hate to say more behaviorism, but there is always a place for behaviorism and behaviorist approaches, and it, it, it is clearly related to the maturity of the learner. That's the best I can do with that question right now. Good, Leanne. Read the book. Give them as Christmas presents to your family. <laughs> the floor is open. I'm looking at Sean's uh, at Sean's question, squinting at it actually because it's so small on my screen. Um, That's a tough one, Sean. You know, my whole my whole career has been pointed to post secondary, although I do get K to twelve folks um, in in my courses. There will always be disruption. There will always be conflict. There will always be best practices and current practices which do not align, and I hear it from my students all the time, no matter what area of the field they're in, whether they're in corporations or business or training, colleges, high school, or, or universities. There just is, Sean. And, you know, we just talked about that in my doctoral course uh, recently. What do you do when your ideology conflicts so badly with the current ideology of your institution. Obviously, um, there is there is difficulty there, and a lot of people sneak under the radar. Quite frankly, there's a lot of academic freedom in universities, but uh, quite, uh, as often as not, the academic freedom is used to cling to old ways and not make the progression and adjustments you should be you should be making. So that in a sense, doesn't turn out to be a great advantage for, for learners. That's the best I can do with that. I don't think we address that question in the book. So I'm making a note of that for the next issue. Diane, it's Cindy. Hi, Cindy. May I offer, yeah, may I offer a thought on that? Um, and it doesn't exactly come out of your book, which I have read, by the way, and recommend highly. But the notion is start small when you're changing your um, assessment practices. You need to ensure that you don't, um, how do I say this, make things worse by taking on a whole new way of doing things until you get comfortable with yourself as an instructor. Uh, and so maybe that's part of the answer to um, your last comment and also to Sean's question. Um, hope that's helpful. Yeah, it is Cindy, and to all of you who don't know Cindy, she's in a fine position, uh, having served as um, academic vice, um, to make to make this kind of uh, suggestion as well. She has a long history in um, instructor design and learning and teaching, so uh, a good suggestion. It reminds me of something a former colleague that you know, as times go by and. Those of us who are just recently retired or pretending to be retired but are legally of age um, get older and we see uh, the new generation coming up behind us. A lot of you won't know some of the folks that I cut my teeth with and whom I looked up to and respected immensely. And one of those people was Liz Burge, Elizabeth Burge 
who was quite a character. I worked with her at the University of New Brunswick, and she has returned uh, in retirement to her native Australia. Liz has a few publications out there and was very seminal in the pioneer days of distance education coming out of the OASE program in Toronto. She used to say, and here's my point, don't be the tall poppy, which was her Australian way of saying, don't stick your head up there because someone's going to knock your poppy head right off. And you've heard that expression in, in various iterations. So it, it's not exactly what Cindy said, but you know, uh, education, like anything else, it's a business. It involves money. It involves politics. It's hard-nosed, and you just kind of got to be smart about what you do. So enough. I hope, I hope you're reading all between my lines there. I'm not particularly subtle. But I don't have to be because I'm retired now. <laughs> Let me quickly read Lorraine's, uh, Lorraine's comment. Um, yes, it, it, it is a comment. And, and that's so true, Lorraine. We have to tell learners who are going to engage in group work uh, what the ground rules are. We have to talk about how to make your way through these sometimes difficult assessment and learning activities successfully. I was in a postgraduate diploma program in business administration, if you can imagine, after a four-year BA and one or two years in a master's that somehow never got completed in American literature before I did my first group work. And I was horrified, just horrified, that I had to work. And because it was a graduate diploma in business administration, all, all my colleagues were, were fellows, most of all, out of BA programs. And I was just like horrified that the fact I had to share my work time with them. But did I ever learn about the value of group work? And it's not all value. There's an upside, there's a downside, and with proper instruction and a great deal of maturity, uh, learners can learn how to make their way through it. We do, in the book, do quite a good job, I think, on group work and talk about the problems of group work, the free riders, you know, the folks who won't do their share, um, and all that kind of thing. So I think you might find some good suggestions in there. Okay, and on that note, perhaps we can wrap up this session. So once again, thank you to our presenter, Dr. Diane Conrad, and uh, be sure to check out her book, Assessment Strategies for Online Learning, Engagement and Authenticity. You'll find a link to that book at our site, along with the slides and a full recording at cider.athabascau.ca. Thank you also to our audience for joining us and raising some uh, great questions. Uh, be sure to join us again on November 7th for a presentation by Joshua Weidlich from Germany.